Okay. Should I share my screen? Yes. Hold on. Let, let Deepak just, just, just give me a few minutes, Dr. Kamath. Uh, so good morning in US. I'm in India. So good evening from here. It's heavy raining here. And uh, just uh, some of you know me. Uh, I'm very excited and I'm very humbled to be part of this community. Thanks to Dr. Amol, who has been constantly inspiring me for past two years whenever I see him in the meeting. Today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, with us our very energetic, uh, very humbled. I have met Dr. Kamat just a couple of times recently and seeing his energy, it's really, really amazing to see we have mentors and teachers like him. Uh, Dr. Bishak Kamat uh, is with us today. He is going to give us a talk uh, with the topic, the radiology report, a very interesting and useful topic for all of us, I would say. Uh, Dr. Kamath is an associate professor of clinical radiology at the Lewis Cat School of Medicine, Temple University. He is originally from Goa, India. Dr. Kamath moved to USA in 1990, where he completed his most of his education, including medical school in upstate New York. Subsequently, he pursued his radiology residency at Cooper University Hospital in Camden and further specialized through fellowships in body imaging at Jefferson and nuclear medicine at Penn. Dr. Kamath is a dual certified uh, radiologist holding uh, both American Board of Nuclear Medicine and American Board of Radiology. His extensive background and expertise in teaching and in clinical profession suited perfectly for today's insightful and valuable talk. Uh, please join me everyone in welcoming Dr. Bishak Kamath. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Deepak. I really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the ISNM, specifically Amol and the team. Um, I, I got to see them at the last meeting. They had a wonderful party. They really know how to do it well. And I'm just very, very um, uh, privileged to be here. Talk about humility. I know some of the people here have seen them lecture. It's just I'm glad to be here. But I'm also equally excited about sharing an important topic slash topics in the future, uh, because at least these two topics, I think personally are very important. And the focus is the message, forget about the messenger. And that is kind of the gist of the point here. Okay, so let me share my screen now, please. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Okay, we're good. And you can hear me, correct? Okay. Yes, we can. Good. Very good. Okay, let me get started then. And let me put a little uh, timer for myself as well, because this is the problem I need to keep to the time. Um, so one of the things is that, um, uh, let me see here. One, before we go into, I'm going to break the ice a little bit. There are various forms of learning, as we know. Uh, and this is a pyramid that we have, which is the learning pyramid. And that is, you know, that lecture, unfortunately, is one of the lowest way we retain uh, material, right? So one of the things is I always like to have a discussion. I like to have a little, because then we remember these things. So first of all, I'm very excited. We have 15 minute kind of whatever q and I'm looking forward to that, to be honest with you, because I, I would like to entertain questions on this area, which I think is uh, beneficial probably to all of us. Um, so that's it with that. Now, I want to go straight to an article, okay, because things are based on facts a little bit at least. Um, and that is in Radiographs in 2020, they wrote a nice article here of how to create a great radiology report. I want to bring your attention right away to the right side. Um, let me get the laser pointer. Um, so I want to bring my, your attention to this area here. At least in the United States, 86% of residents report one hour of dedicated didactic instruction annually. Now, what we mean by that is a lecture, a devotion to this. See, you're talking about reports all the time, but a devotion to just the report, 86% of fact, 86% of residents report one hour of didactic instruction annually. Now, you talk about the importance of a radiology report and the allocated time to that, that's a huge discrepancy. So this is why this is important based on facts. So with that said, let us focus on some of these pointers. Number one, radiology report is the most important product that radiologists generate to help direct patient care. 
all right so i'm setting the tone for why i'm doing this okay next radiologists re usually receive little or no formal i just mentioned that reporting education during training it's usually done quote piecemeal and often indirect fashion through occasional correction and imitating the reports of other radiologists okay so now let us delve into what these elements should entail to make a good report facts finding section should be short okay informative factual while avoiding inappropriate interpretation excessive use of terms of perception and redundancy all right the impression should be a thoughtful synthesis of the meaning of the findings leading to a diagnosis a differential diagnosis and management recommendations all right that's the point of an impression the impression should now use language that is understandable to patients and clinicians memorable and actionable i repeat understandable memorable and actionable reporting skills notice it's a skill requires ongoing attention and must adapt to the evolving practice patterns all right that is the setting we, we are in now okay all right so with that said my objectives for this talk are to realize the need for education to trainees and this is obviously we're all trainees in some sense right so this is all for all of us to sort of look at right uh, identify good and not so good elements of a radiology report and start to put into practice some or all of these tenets as you see fit for yourself and your trainees let me outline i'm going to go into what we call the again re-emphasize the purpose and the importance of a report more formally elements of a report i'm going to go through them from my perspective having done many of them examples of reports i will you know just give some general examples that's not the point the point is to sort of give the process okay and then i want to weave in this is where my uh, pronunciation is bad please weave w-e-a-v-e -E, some of these other concepts okay that i some of them i just turned all right to interject and talk about that in the process of a report all right so let's delve in shall we let's have some fun purpose of a report is threefold as far as I can, I'm, I'm concerned number one it's a medical legal document all right this concept of oh but you know i thought but you know i meant to say doesn't work the medical legal realm certainly in the united states your report is your document okay no questions about it now though good news and the bad news here is, is, is as such a lot of people say the clinicians only read the impression well medical legally the, the the responsibility is to look at the full report that is not debatable point one the flip side is what you say in any part of the report you're also responsible for right so it's a game of knowing that your full document is what is counted doesn't matter what you think it's what you said that's one element and the other is the clinician is responsible to also look at the whole thing regardless of whether they want to focus on the impression or not medical legally all right second point is interpretation guides management all right this is one of the reasons i put two more boards in my humble opinion we in the united states we need to do a little bit better job in getting trainees to participate or be present at tumor boards and have some background of some of the clinical stuff because if you understand the context of your report in the management of what's going to happen you render a better report zero question in my mind so we need to do a better job in training to get you to focus on the outcome of what you say and you need to learn how to close the loop on some of that if i may pathology surgery what happened right we sometimes leave these loopholes completely open costing ourselves from bettering ourselves in our report in my opinion third is to communicate findings the most important reasons for medical errors are twofold failure to communicate and failure to diagnose well failure to diagnose is your skill diagnostic radiologist that's what i am right diagnose all right so that's the x and o's 
But there is a bigger element there is the failure to communicate. So you can make findings, talk about findings, but then you actually have to learn how to communicate those findings through a report, not your verbose ways, but through a report in technical, succinct ways. And that is an art itself. And it's really important because it's one of the two elements of errors. That's kind of important. It's got a lot of revenue associated with that. Errors cost the healthcare big time. All right. So the importance of a report. Number one, you have to own your report. Now, this is something I really emphasize to my uh, trainees um, is that one of the things I pride myself uh, uh, is that when I started my residency here on day one, all right, this I'm very happy about, to be very honest with you. I owned my report. Okay, and day one, because you know, there's a tendency to say, I don't know the radiology, I don't know this, I don't know this, but you'll be shocked at how much control you have as a first year radiology resident having done an internship here in the United States and what is in your control. For example, let me give you, let me bring it straight to the facts. You can proofread a report. That is not a skill that's beyond your level. You can, you can, you can check certain elements that are all there. Comparison is the correct comparison, all those things, right? You can read prior reports. You may not have the knowledge of the radiology, but you can at least be aware of what other people said on prior reports. These are habits you have to build as a trainee so that then you can have those habits when you become attending. So again, my point is you start early with these habits, right? So you have to own your report, all right? So you have to pay attention. You have to check. Think about what you're stating is exactly what you mean. This is an unfortunate thing that we don't teach very often. Because when I ask my residents, some of my trainees, they say, oh, that, that's easy. That's what's going on in this case. And they're right. They're often just right. But then I look at the report and the report says nothing that you just told me. And that's a problem, right? That in itself is a skill that needs to happen. All right. So so it's it's all about kind of right hand has to talk to the left hand to get the report out. That's important. Now, let me talk about some irony here. You know, uh, my wife and, you know, she, when she, when we sort of wrap gifts and like that, she's always doing great job. All the creases of the gift, everything is just sharp and nice and turned. And it's like, you know, you present it like very good, high quality stuff, right? When we plan for life events, interviews for job, we take our notes, we plan it out, weddings, we plan like everything, right? We choose to put what on social media, what to send our friends. We are extreme great filterers of all this, right? But here's the problem. I've got no issue with that. But when we come to a report, which has got a lot more ramifications or equal ramifications as some of these other things, I will say at least, right? We don't put that same level of energy in that, all right? We don't put our effort into checking these things that if the optics of what you're sending is up to par to what you want. I don't think we do that enough. All right. Another reason I'm talking about this topic. So reports, I tell my trainees, when I'm the attending, it's my face. When they're, they're attending, it's their face. Reports are a representation of you. All right. And that's my little transition there. All right. So, we have to tailor our reports, um, you know, to the various referring physician communication part, right? The referring physicians, the, here's the trick. The reference is not one group, right? It could be your general practice person. It could be ob -GYN, It could be urology. It could be hemonc. So your reports then by definition and common sense cannot, even if it's the same reported findings, you cannot tailor that report and have the same report across various referring physicians. That is wrong. That is not right. That is not correct, in my opinion. You have to tailor it to the person reading it. Just like when I'm giving this lecture, I need to know who the audience is, right? So you have to tailor, start tailoring a baseline to the various referring groups. Very important. Number two, you have to be clear and concise, okay? All right, very important. And then you have to participate and engage, okay? Now we have we use Radiant here. I don't know what other people are using software, but it is so easy now. You click a case and you're right there into electronic medical record. I have never seen it that easy. And yet I notice people are don't know tumor markers, the trends, this. I, I'm shocked at the level of lack of detail of 
filling in the reports that will upstage your pre-test and how you're going to cajole your impression that we are having our reports, right? It's easier than ever. I mean, when I started, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to date myself here, but when I started, we didn't have that ready-made access to electronic medical record that we do now integrated into radiology. No question about that. All right, facts based on articles again. Reporting radiology, which these are the eight, 10 members, okay? Eight members who are looking at our report. See that? That's the complexity of a report I'm going to point out now. You are the reporting radiologist. So what do you need from your report? Well, a place to organize your thoughts, a sounding board for yourself, technical accuracy, provide a complete evaluation, great. But there are many other people involved. Other radiologists need to be able to follow your report. All right, <laughs> very important point here. Okay, they need to have enough detailed information to help guide follow-up examinations. Primary care providers need clear specific recommendations for follow-up, what to do. Subspecialty physicians need fewer specific recommendations because they know what they're doing in their, in their respective area. But they need greater dealing de detail sorry, in the staging and treatment planning. Patients need understandable reports. This is a huge thing now. Right, patient journey, we, we, the, 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 how to use terminology, A, not offensive, B, understandable, tone it down in terms of the language and the jargon that we use, so that, because often now, fact, often now, it's written about in the articles, the patients see the report now with, um, with some of the new laws passed before the clinicians do. That is not understatement in the United States. That happens. So you got to be careful what you say, right? Patient, uh, patients, billing, very important. You know, I, I, as you well know, you don't get paid unless certain elements are in the report. Important, okay? Researchers need certain things for, you know, measuring and things like that to keep track of, right? And lawyers, you bet, are looking at reports when things are in trouble, right? So you need to have some sort of protective language, limitations built in as well into the reports, certain elements, right? Okay, so you see one report goes to eight people. And I hope you appreciate that because there lies its complexity. The point is reports are heterogeneous. You have to know who the audience you're getting the message across to. And it's not as simple as saying it's point A to point B. It's not, okay? So I've come up with the uh, terms and, you know, don't laugh. You know, I used to say, I, I have upstairs is the findings and downstairs is the impression. Now, first time I said that to one of the residents, they were when I said upstairs, they looked at upstairs if somebody's upstairs. No, no, no. So the upstairs is the findings and the downstairs is the impression. So in the upstairs and the findings, things are, I focus on, let's say we have a mass or a lesion and some of this will be re repeated. So don't worry. One of my points is you have to, whenever you have a focused observation, a mass or a lesion, you have to talk or at least address a lot of these pointers, size, the mass effect on vessels and nodes has to be talked about on that particular positive finding. Use proper terminology. This is another thing. Let me point out. Simple thing, but let me point out. Density, echogenicity, signal intensity are fumbled up. I see reports that talk about, and we do it all. We all do it intrinsically. We don't even realize. We talk about, echo. sometimes I see intensity mentioned in the CT report, right? Remember, signal intensity is MRI. Density is more of the radiographs in the CT, right? Echogenesis, the ultrasound. You cannot mingle that. And you cannot say that's minor. I didn't, you know, that's kind of understandable. It's not. You're the radiologist. The clinicians, if you start putting reports like that, will then start, you know, if they're really astute about it, they'll say, well, well does this person, you know, I'm getting a little confused with the message here, right? So you have to pay details matter. Details matter. Positive finding. Spend time being clear on the description and then give pertinent negatives. So, I will be talking shortly about signal to noise and I will get some of these points in shortly. Fibroids or anything like that, I have a tendency to organize as follows. I organize it in what I call a tabular form like this. So I'll say few fibroids represent as follows. I will not go marking 18 of them. Okay, I'll mark two of them per organ, let's say. And this is the way I organize it. I put my F1, I mark my image F1. I put F2, I mark my image F2. So now packs, when they open up there, I make the job of the reader as easy as possible to find the things. And then I put X, Y, Z centimeter, semicolon, parts of whatever it is, comma, parts of mucosa, part number, comma, mid body mass. So it's the X, Y plane, right, of the fibroid. 
the other plane, mid body, and the enhancement pattern. The next one is in the same organized way. The measurement, the X plane, the Y plane, the, no, the enhancement. I don't jumble these all over the place. Okay, now you might say, yeah, but let us say you put no enhancement here. What's the big deal? I mean, at the end of the day, it's all covered. Why are you making a big deal out of it? Optics, optics, okay? How you present, it's like good handwriting, right? How you present shows how you think. Ultimately, it shows representative who you are. So it's not minor. It's not minor. You cannot just keep saying everything is stylistic. Okay, we do that. That's another thing we do. We sort of chalk up everything to stylistic. This has nothing to do with style. Style would be how I say it. If I'm putting these things in organized, it has to be organized. Okay, in my opinion. Downstairs. Impression. This is very important. Impression is what do you think? All right. I'll give you a simple example. Very simple example. You say there is cardiomegaly, interlobular septal thickening, pleural effusions. You don't copy paste that again in the impression. All right. You are the radiologist. You know what that means compatible with CHF. You have to say that. That is what you get paid for. You can't just list a finding and, and, and that is not enough. And I've seen that a lot. You are getting paid to make your opinion. Maybe right sometimes, maybe wrong sometimes. I understand that. But you are getting paid to give a rendered opinion in your report. All right? And that's important. You cannot just rehash the descriptions. I don't believe that. Third, third point is stick to three points. 95% of my reports, exception may be the complex mess of inpatients that we scan, especially in an academic institution. Those are hard. But on generic level, 95% of my reports today in 2024 have three points and three points only in my impression. All right. And they tend to go along this kind of order. Number one, I answer the question. I've seen so many reports. I don't even care whether you get it right or not to answer it or you sort of hedge it because of quality issues and all that. That is, that is fine. That is fine. But if you, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is I will see a statement made about two other things and maybe the answer is buried in the fourth point or the answer is not really answered to the exact question that is asked. Sometimes we don't even know what the question is. Don't laugh. Okay. That, that doesn't, that is not very uncommon either, which is why you got to figure out what the question is. Okay. So, Answering the question is very important, right? That gives the value to the report. Number two, life-threatening stuff obviously should be. That we do good job because we are kind of told about that a lot. And then change in management follow-up. Those two actually we do better job. But the only reason I point these out is because if you get these points on, other things have to start dropping out, all right? And I'll talk about some of that. That is my point. So within these three, you're kind of stuck with three points, like you cannot start putting in other things that are irrelevant or minor in here. That is the point of listing this, okay? All right. Now let me go into sections of the report. How are we doing? I hope we're doing good on time. I have 1024, so okay, let's keep going. So the sections of the report. Now I'm gonna delve into each one a little bit if I may. So history, this is what I call the homework. And again, I always encourage my trainees before delving into your case, understand the pretest probability both in nuclear medicine and in certainly nuclear medicine and also in radiology you need to check the epic for history you need to know the interim therapies and dates you need to know pertinent areas of trauma external signs of injury in the area you need to know lmp for pelvic ultrasound it's again you, you'll be so shocked you know i mentioned this stuff and then you'll see that these are not mentioned <laughs> or, or we have to hunt for them all right the, the reason i'm writing these things down please understand Specific query as rule out, they tend to, we, we, we rather use evaluate for, as you know. That's the history section. Comparison, this is very important. I only list the date, this is not commonly known, so I'm telling you. I only list the date of the study which I've thoroughly compared to. Let me give my example, because again, I'm being vague. If I have a CT from date A, and I'm reading my CT for staging, let's say, reading my CT for date B. My comparison will be CT of date A. Anything interim that is a sister, mean, or sister or brother, meaning same modality, CT, would be comparison, right? So it's comparison A. And then in B, let's say something in the middle was a pet, then I may call that a correlation. I call that correlation, 
that's minor point. So I put pet. So I'll have comparison from May 2024, CT abdomen pelvis, correlation, FTG pet CT. And I'm all knows very well, there are a million kinds of pets. So I absolutely specify what kind of pet I'm talking about. That is very important 2024. FTG pet CT in June 2024, whatever. And now I'm doing the August. So what that means, when I put that, let me clarify what I'm saying. When I put that, Dr. Kamat, you can be fully assured, has read the full entire report of the prior CT and has read the full entire report of the FTG pet CT. No questions asked. I can assure you I've done that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone in my comparison section, okay? What does not go in my comparison section is a statement like multiple studies were compared to dating back to X. I would highly discourage that kind of verbiage and I'll tell you why. So medical legally, when you put multiple studies dating back to X, you are responsible that you have checked all those studies whether you like it or not. So then you are in trouble because you cannot say, I didn't know that there was a X date study in between this lineup of eight that I didn't see. But then you said you looked at multiple studies dating back to X in your report. Simple as that. What you said and what you thought, those are different. So now you might say, well, then what happens, Kamath, if you had a chest nodule that was not in your CT and PET CT? How do you handle that? I'm sorry, I'm asking my own question. Sorry. So... The way I do that is in that particular case, if I've read the CT chest from 2018 fully, I don't mind if you put comparison, but most of us don't have that level of energy to do that fully. So what I'll do is that's okay. In that particular elemental report, let's say long basis, I'll say this nodule has been stable since 2018 parentheses CT chest and just bury that in the findings of the report. That's okay. That's okay. That what that means is that I compared the CT chest report from 2018 for that nodule, not the whole thing. And it's very clear by that. Okay. So yes, now you, and I know you're thinking, oh my God, uh, you know, this is very detailed uh, looking at things. Yes. And that's important. That in itself shows attention to detail, right? Very important. Number two is technique. So technique section is, you know, you have various things that are needed for billing. So ultrasound, you have to add Dopplers, color spectral. In CT, you have to add MIPS, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you have to talk about. MRI, MRCP element has to be there. This is billing issues. In nuclear medicine, you need to certainly have the dose, right? Enteric contrast needs to be mentioned. IV content is specific contrast agent. But not only that, that is the protocol. That's great. You need to comment on that. Number two is also you need to comment on artifacts and limitations. We have so many people, arms by the side of the patient that blocks your viewpoint of seeing the lower chest and upper abdomen. It is important to mention that. Some people are like, well, that's like caveating everything. Well, it's important because you may miss some subcentimeter liver uh, uh, thing. And if you sort of mention that and you're seeing a limitation there, then it's important to mention. And another reason I will tell you what's important to mention, when I have, when, when, when things get, you know, medical, legal, whatever, right? One of the things they do, I, I have not been in that situation, but I'm just saying one of the things they do is they look, I've been mock trials, I've seen mock trials, right? One of the things they do is they look at your habits, okay? They'll pull up like 80 reports and see how you do. Well, if you're the type of person that has the caveats properly in many of your reports that are worthy, that are like real, okay? Not just something, you know, it shows that you have a tendency to pay attention to detail. It, it shows your tendency. You see that? And that's important. So it adds up. These are like things that add up in your bank of who you are. You know what I mean? And that's important. Patient related. So anyway, I mentioned the common artifact limitation. Patient related issues. Be very sensitive. See, I, I've seen people talk about, you know, patient is too big. Patient is fat. Okay. Maybe in 1980, you know, 80s, that was okay. But 2024, people are reading that and then they get offended. You know, one time there was an atrophy of a kidney something and the prior person said nephrectomy. So I fell in what we call the bias, lead bias, what do you want to say? So I, I said the same thing. Um, got a phone call from the via, via the clinician. They said the patient is very upset because, you know, your kidneys are out, you, you guys said, and the kidney is still in. He never had surgery. Please attend the report saying that it's atrophic kidney. You see that? That is how sometimes things come back. Okay. So uh, people are reading this stuff. When you think they're not, they're reading it. So you have to be careful. Insignificant findings should be limited, like atelectasis. 
organized uh, for findings i'm talking about the upstairs now organized for uh, lesions and label the images this is very important in my opinion today with packs i label them i take screenshots if i need to people for some reason are scared to put arrows and things listen you want to make you don't want to put 50000 arrows but you want to make you always when i render my report i'm thinking okay who is my person going to read this and how can i make their life easier i always have that in my mind as i'm reading my reports because whatever i can do to make the other person's life easier they will like me and i'll it's good to be liked in this kind of situation right we bring good report tailor report to the clinical scenario pertinent negative ct chest for trauma should be talking about no mediastinal no hematoma no pulmonary contusion the reason i bring this up is because some of our standard templates you know person is coming for trauma we are rendering don't laugh we, see when i'm mentioning this you will start laughing but you will see reports like this somebody comes to trauma we are talking in the bones about no ct suspicious osseous lesions it's a standard it's in the template so people are just mentioning that without thinking about it. you know please understand the er the trauma of attending they're looking at the report looking for pertinent things that they're interested in right it's not the negative doesn't really matter but it kind of doesn't make sense to be talking about suspicious osseous lesions a walkie talkie 30 year old coming for trauma right without any history of malignancy right I mean, if it was a cancer center case and you're talking about a cancer, that is fine. These are the kind of level of details I'm talking about, all right? Details are important. Describe in detail. And one of the things I talk about details is, my, my, which I loved, is this on a beach theory, right? When I'm on my vacation and I'm, you know, sitting, your description, what is my criteria for good description? Your description should be with my eyes closed. I can envision what you're talking about. Then I know you've done a good job describing Anything short of that, you have to work on that description. Remember, I am all about poo-pooing the noise in a report which I want to talk about and focusing on the signal, which, is, which is, we, we don't talk about reports that way. So that is a theory I want to talk about shortly. Very important. So tiny things, I give the series and image number, something we forget to do. I mark my images as I told you. Uh, appendix that took me 15 minutes, I might put a little small arrow there so that people know where the appendix is, the follow-up, right? I do the little things that get me brownie points, if you will, all right? I do that all the time. Use standardized terminology. Radlax RSNA is there. Pyrads, we use rads, rads, rads everywhere. You should try to formulate things into a standard as much as you can. I'm not saying you have to use it all the time, but pertinent and, and with your local institution, yes, you should. So I already went through this. We don't need to go through this hash again, but for a legion of mass, these elements should be talked about for sure. All right, impression, very important. Let's slow down here. It is not a rehash of the findings. The interpretation, 3.95 reports answer the query. Life-threatening stuff. We use critical results for major findings. We have three. See, we have things built in for these. We call critical results. We have we have unexpected findings to make phone calls to the doc. So everybody's now starting to have this. In the United States, we're, we're building these things. So, um, so that, you know, uh, we, we, we have that. So now usually bulleted i usually put it in some sort of bulleted or num numeric fashion i do not write paragraphs i don't write sentences in my reports like that okay certainly not the impression level and i know the reader i always think about the reader okay impression number two point tidbit for the trainees you got one of the ways in my opinion mentally i guess psychologically you do a better job with the impression is twofold in my opinion number one when you're starting it's important to take a deep breath literally between your findings and before you write your impression. That activity of taking the breath will itself help you to realize you're in a different section that you have to formulate what you think. That break of thinking of what you said, connecting those dots and making a thought is important. So what am I trying to convey here? And have I done it succinctly? Got rid of all these extra terms like is identified, is visualized, terms that are not necessary and got the point across, right? Make it clear what you're thinking. And I don't usually say no further follow-up. This was also talked about in, in, in some of the mock trials. This is me, I'm giving my opinion. No, not everybody has to agree on that. Is that no further follow-up because the problem is if something were to turn something and you said no further follow-up, they could absolutely come back and say, you said no follow-up. Even though some of the guidelines mention that kind of lingo, I don't tend to use that. Uh, the other thing I don't tend to use, if I may just digress for a second, is in the report, I don't tell people to move lines here and there. 
I, I, I don't do that. I'm not saying that's wrong or right. I don't do that for very simple reasons or medical legal because if, God forbid, in that particular patient, if you move something and something happens, people will say that you told me to move it and retract it and push it. That's what people say. Again, these are things I don't do. Reader should not be guessing based on clear, unclear and incomplete elements and recommendation should be precise. This is very important. Recommendation should be precise. As an example, MRI abdomen without and with contrast, liver protocol in three months. That is how my recommendations are. What, how, where, when. All of that has to be there. Uh, you cannot just say MRI. Nobody knows what you're talking about. You cannot just say PET CT. Amol will show you 15 PET CTs. You know, you got to tell which you're talking about. Very important today, okay? Corrections, addendums. Okay, this is this is more of an attending level thing. So if your final report, again, a fumbling thing I see, if final report is different than the prelim, you have to show the time spent in clarity. So let us say the resident or trainee read preliminary findings were reported said. You don't have to tell all the corrections you made. That is, people can track that with compare, revise and all that. But let us say I had a final report. So I will say preliminary X, final report rendered by Kamut at time Y. I must state that like that. You cannot just get rid of the prelim and do like that. You have to legally state your X time point and then your Y time point. That is very important. Very important. Another point. This is, a, you'll be surprised. Not all elements here. ACR criteria. Document has to have five elements when you're giving a result. I have a macro called results built in for that. Name, title of who you're speaking with, mode of communication, time, date, and by far the most important is a closed loop statement called acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, read back, acknowledged, understood. You better have that, otherwise you're in trouble, because it is not a communication until it's closed the loop. Very very important. Even I might say, what happens if you electronically send electronic, but then I see it's checked by seen seen by them. I acknowledge. I even will sometimes say, hey, I'm let, letting you know I'm acknowledging you. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so you cannot leave it open ended because something happens. They, will, they can always say you didn't put that, that it was acknowledged. You know what I mean? So it's very important. If new information was added, make note of that because that may be the reason you're providing the addendum. Okay, that's fine. All right, now I'd like to digress slightly, if I may, to some philosophical points that are associated with reports, okay? Number one, I already talked about ownership. Ownership is so important as a trainee. This is something we all, in my humble opinion, need to do a better job. We have to teach trainees to own the report. What I mean by that is this. When I sign a first year report, yes, of course, I'm responsible for it. That's a given. We don't need to be reminded of that. But at the end of the day, I have my 15 reports, whatever it is, X number, plus I'm signing your report. Your reports, I expect you to take some ownership on your report. That's important. And I got to build that habit in day one. Do I do that? Yes, of course I do that. Okay. So, so. I, and I did that as a resident. One of the reasons, I, one, frankly, my attendings loved me. They were uh, honestly fighting over me for the overnight reads, to be honest with you. Don't laugh seriously. Because they loved the, they knew when they signed my report, accuracy is a separate issue. That's a separate issue. They knew that typographical errors, these things, everything was relatively accurate. It was easy to sign. They loved that about my reports. When I was a trainee, I'm talking about, okay? And that is the habit I expect of others when I'm working with, with me. Next is conveyor belt theory. Very important. I, I, I sort of coined this idea, this conveyor belt, this that, that, that as the patient goes in a system, you should know and try to, I talk to the overnight people all the time about this. You should know where is this patient going? Is it going to be a surgical case, an acute case, discharge, where? If you can figure that out, then you can render that report to cajole it to get to that spot. It's not a concept we think about very often. It is not a concept we think about. So that is why one of, one of the things I've learned is people that come from surgical, I'm not biased, people that come from surgical backgrounds, IR, etc. when they go, they tend to do better job with the reports. Why? Because they understand the management of it. So that's the conveyor belt. Third is satisfaction of service. This everybody knows. So I'm going to just point out. The only point I want to make about this, and I've also fumbled in this, I'm very good about trying to let go of the first finding, appendicitis, whatever, and focus on many other ones. And I know about the appendicitis. So like, I, I try to just get it. Okay, saw it. Great. Next. Next. 
next. And that is how I tend to make my findings better because I, I don't get excited about the first finding. It's likened to the football uh, game, right? With the quarterback, right? You make the first look, you make the second look, you make the third look, you make the fourth look. And that is how you don't get excited about one, one situation. And that is how you try to minimize your errors. And this is a concept I loved. I just entered in here called mingling. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's something else I coined is that mingling is this idea that I'm starting to note, notice in the reports. I'll give you one like minor example of it is people will say cholelithiasis without bilirectal dilation. See? Now, we all know that cholelithiasis can affect the bilirectals. We know that the hepatobiliary system is connected, sure. But the concept that a stone in the gallbladder suddenly is talking about bilirectal dilation in the same sentence is a confusing way to talk about it. You could say cholelithiasis without pericholocystic inflammation, period, no biliary ductal dilation. See, it's the minor things. But the thing is, it is not minor. It creates confusion in the reader. And one of the elements and responsibilities you have in an annual report is good communication, right? So if you mingle all over the place, then you also set a confused kind of situation for follow-up and things like that, right? If people don't understand necessarily what you mean, you spark phone calls, all right? So this is mingling. It's a concept I point, coined there. All right, now let us delve into some examples, shall we? We're doing great. Okay, so we'll go fast through these. So linear, these are like some random reports, okay? Real, but random reports. There are linear areas of increased density in the left lower lobe, reaching pleural surface, upward shift of hemidiaphragm, volume loss, cardiomediastinal you know, results in the shift of the cardiomediastinal silhouette. Okay, how many words? 15, okay? Basically, they were trying to tell you it's atelectasis. Say that? So... Now, it's like the ophthalmologist, right? Where they go A versus B, right? And you say this is more clear, okay? So then you should go with clarity, right? Something smaller. Next, linear opacity is left lung base, left renal stone, left gluteal wispy infiltration may be contusion. Cardiomyositis rosa to the right indicates tension. This is a person that just started writing things down and didn't realize that they need to reorder this in priority, right? They didn't do that. You could have put it like this in a succinct manner. Right pneumothorax, tension component. Left obstructive uropathy, left subcutaneous contusion. Again, A versus B, ophthalmology. Right? You tell me. Okay? Example 3. A 1.3 centimeter, oh, oh sorry, 0.3 centimeter mass left kidney. 3 millimeter right humeral sclerotic lesion. 15 centimeter infrarenal aortic aneurysm. See that? I did that very subtly. I wanted to show you that there could be some confusion there. That's why you should put some article in between these, right? A subtle move, but very important medical legally because if those things move, it's hard to read. There's a big difference between a 1.3 centimeter mass and a 3 millimeter mass. The other thing is they jumped around in units within the same report. That will also create confusion for the reader. So if you're centimeters, stick with centimeters. Look at this. A versus B. Which do you like? All right. There you go. Subtle. Now, how hard was that to do that? Not very. Did it make a difference in patient care? Very much so. Very much so, in my opinion. Okay? Very much so. Example four. Left renal mass, right sclerotic lesion, left lower extremity thrombus. Then we come here. We talk about left sclerotic lesion, left thrombus, left renal mass. What happened here? Right and left. Confused. Is this in the right? I'm asking. Now I'm the reader. I'm sorry, is the lesion on the right, in the left? I see the images. I don't really know how to read those images. So I'm asking you. I don't really check my images as a clinician. Now I'm confused. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to make a phone call. For sure, I'm getting a phone call, right? So I uh, don't laugh. I actually caps lock my right and left. I do. I do. I do do that because it's an intrinsic check for me to know how to keep. Because please understand, in nuclear medicine, I'm flipped. Then I go to body, I'm flipped. Uh, you know, I, this is happening on a daily basis, right? So you have to talk about these things uh, properly. Hypometabolic right lung mass indicates malignancy. Nodes are showing uptake, maybe banana malignant. Lytic lesion in the bone, likely focal osteopenia. This is a subtle one. This is my final example, very subtle. All right, I don't know if you picked up on it. Number one, hypermetabolic indicates malignancy. Okay, that's minor. That you say is minor. Now, now this is where the problem happened. This is a very major point I want to share. In radiology, as you well know, words have meanings. So if you're talking about something lytic, you intrinsically are implying that it is malignant in your mind. Whether you say it or not, that is understood by the general community. Okay. So if you thought it was osteopenia, probably shouldn't use the word lytic. You understand what I'm trying to say? And same thing, if 
nodes are showing uptake. Maybe banana or malignant. I, I see this all banana or malignant. Well, was there some third option there? So you see what I'm saying? So, so if you don't know to know what exactly it is, then you can just leave it as a description. That part is fine. But then if you say banana malignant, this kind of makes it seem like there's no other option there, right? For them. So anyway, the point I'm making is consistency in the language you use. Lucency, which suggests benign lytic, will be more implicated, right? And uh, and why are you putting normals in the impression? Like, I don't understand that, right? That makes no sense, okay? So that's it. So now let me finish up with a few points and then I'll open it up to questions, okay? So report should be clear, concise, unambiguous. I'm summarizing. Not sure I agree about... Uh, so structured reports tend to be... More, are, are better than unstructured reports. That's well written up. I don't think I need to really go into this. Um, you know, I, I think it's very self-explanatory with that one. But this is the concept I would like to talk about if I don't know. Now, we talk about signal-to-noise. Everybody here is an expert on signal-to-noise when it comes to the imaging, right? We intrinsically know signal-to-noise. I have only one question for you. Who talks about, till now, who has talked, to be honest, about signal-to-noise in two areas? One, you looking into people's order and things like that in signal-to-noise, and you rendering a report signal-to-noise. Has anybody talked about that? Okay, so... The point is that, so one of the things I do with medical students is I force them to look up, they're sitting behind me, I look, I, when a case comes up and I, medical students I'm talking about, when a case comes up and I need something looked up, I tell them to look it up. They're behind me, I let them look it up. You can see the frustration on their face because they're angry, they cannot find the information in the epic so easily. I don't tell them anything, I just keep my mouth shut. In about four weeks, they're angry because they were so frustrated in looking and trying to find the information. And I say, well, there you go. You're asking how to render a good indication, how this, there's your experience. You don't need me to tell you anything. If you thought whatever was frustrating you to get to the information, just don't do that for the next person. Simple as that. And they, they're very happy at the end of the experience, but they're really upset through the four weeks because they're looking up stuff and they can't find it. That is exactly signal to noise. That's exactly signal to noise. A very important concept in looking at other people's indications and stuff because we don't often get that. And then also looking at your images, search pattern is a signal to noise, right? And dictating report is a signal to noise. Organized. So who talks about signal to noise in this realm? You heard it here. Signal to noise is very important report. You know, one of the things I loved in fellowship is somebody had come a very intelligent person. It was his own thing. He came up, now everybody does it, but at that time, somebody came up with, it was color coded. So the attending would correct it and it would color code what the corrections are. And I loved it. It improved me tremendously. As soon as I opened, did my report, attending signed it, I look at every night, I would go and look at it. And the number of corrections, the number of colors, I would try to minimize that as I go, each reiteration of my reports. And that's how I got better. That's how I got better. The way I got better, if I may say, in my reports are few four. Number one, I read every single person's report, prior reports. So at this point, for example, in my place, I know everybody's reports, how they report, with my eyes closed. Okay, with my eyes closed. That's a tremendous advantage I have because I know everybody in my group, how they report things. Okay, I, I, I know it, <laughs> all right? Um, secondly, is this compare revise thing that I've done with, you know, when I was a trainee that helped me. So those are the ways I got better. And then I, I see trainees now phrasing things a little bit better than me, whatever. I'll incorporate that and make it into macro usage. I'm always learning. That's what that first article talked about, right? To improve my report. Doesn't matter how many years I've done it. I'm always improving to make it better. Okay, so upstairs, downstairs, spell check, proofread, compare, revise. Okay, and uh, I want to summarize, I think, the end here. Deliver the goods. Okay, anchor the impression with favored diagnostic differential. Analysis. State it clearly what you want. Keep it relevant. Think about the next step. This is from the article. And continue to grow. See that? Continue to grow on your report. I'm always trying to improve myself. Nowhere close to perfection. But I put my time in. In report, I put my time in. And that is not something you hear people talking, that I put effort into report. Sometimes people look at me and I correct the report when I'm starting with the first years, and they're like, this is crazy. You go into this much level of attention to your reports. Yeah, because it's the most important thing I render for patient care. Why should I not delve my energy there? It's important, right? So my viewpoint of trainees, if I may give, in terms of reporting, is at the first year level, obviously, you're trying to figure out the search pattern, you're trying to report the findings. In your second, you're trying to handle the normals versus abnormals and learn in your report how to sort of cajole that and use the language. 
by your junior to senior, whether it comes to the third and fourth years, you're trying to create a report. I'm giving you my idea of how I how I judge the levels. Create a report. And by fourth year, you should really, the attending should be relatively signing most of your reports. Now, if this is not a transition that you are moving along, let's get people on board to move people along, right? Because this is what the whole point of this lecture is, is that I think there is a need for it. I think it's an important need. And I think we need to all, in my humble opinion, do a better job in meeting that need. Which is why I hope a lecture like this, the message is more important than the messenger. And I leave you with that. And these are thank yous from all over the world. I leave you at that. I hope that was valuable to, to all of you. Um, and uh, I hope I did a um, decent job in getting the points across. And I'm, I'm, I'm open to any questions. Okay, so do I stop sharing my screen at this point, Deepak? I think you can leave it there, uh, Dr. Kama. That was excellent talk. Thank you so much. I have so many questions, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I, uh, I can reach out to you later. My uh, one question which I want to ask you now is when we are doing reports, and you know, I personally am just graduated, and we really face difficulty in describing when we have limited epic history. And we are saying that, okay, this is compatible with, this is consistent with, this is less likely, this is highly suspicious, uh, you know, things like that describing this. So first we'll put all the consistent compatible stuff. We don't know the biopsy and some of the cases, then we have like, okay, this is suspicious for lymphoma or whatever. And then we are like less likely, maybe reactive. So do you have any suggestion for that? Like, you know, uh, should we make it? Any any idea to make it any better or maybe different? That is a great question. That is a commonly stated question in this realm. And let me guide my thoughts on that. Number one, this basically gets the great point, Deepak, if I may summarize your question, is what, what language, what words, the words we use indicating level of our confidence is what you're talking about. So... People used to put percentages on saying may represent has a lower, I'm just making it up, may represent has lower with likely more uh, level of percentage of confidence, consistent with has more level of confidence. There was an article written on that, they well studied that. And what from my understanding of reading that article was that really it was a binary situation. Majority of the lingo didn't mean diddly squat to the clinicians except for consistent um most consistent with or most compatible with definitely consistent right those meant you are very confident rest of it was a bill back bell curve didn't mean diddly squat now mm -hmm. if i may elaborate on that i do use terminologies regardless of that article certainly i use that terminologies to indicate my level of confidence i think you have every right to do that i told you, you don't know, feel right or wrong and we it's not a it's not a black and white situation it's a gray zone i respect that gray zone we are allowed to have a gray zone you're supposed to answer the question but you're allowed to have a gray zone i do not believe that answers have to be 100 percent. we are part of the care team we are not the care team to be clear entirely so i'm okay with that i'm actually on the side of stating things now what do i do to handle that if i may elaborate deepak one is i call it the like a soccer analogy right um uh, the red card the yellow card and the green card right uh, you, you, the flags right that you throw in soccer i love analogies mm -hmm. and i love sports so please bear with me so mm -hmm. i use the red card sparing red card r r stands for recommend okay i rarely use recommend there are only two maybe three, whatever conditions I use that to be very specific. Number one, I use recommend when I am trying to force the issue to get to a conveyor belt theory. So if I feel they're going to discharge a patient, let us say I'm making it up and I need them to get to a surgical consultation like for bowel obstruction or something like that, I will say recommend because I don't want that discharge because I've seen people talking ileus versus obstruction. They put both as 50-50% in the report. Person get discharged, comes back with a rip-roaring ischemia. I've seen that happen. All right, I've seen that happen. There, you have to sometimes know the situation and cajole it, make a phone call, close the loop. You've got to do that, right? So I would use recommend. In certain, that, maybe that's a bad example, but I use recommend. In that. The second time you use recommend is guidelines. If I know it's a few co guidelines for pancreas protocol, go two months, that is not debatable. 
that's based on the guidelines you put the citation recommend one to two year whatever it is blah boom in there that's a recommend majority of the times however i do not do not use recommend i use suggest and then if i'm really don't care about it, i'll say may represent that's the green light i don't use much of that either i don't use recommend either my most li likely is the yellow card and the reason i do that if i may elaborate on that deepak is that I have seen, I've attended millions of tumor boards, okay? I have seen clinicians get very upset, when more upset, when you're forcing their hand with recommend, when they again are the care team, to be clear, they don't like to be forced and they're wrist twisted by the word recommend. That upsets them. So you have, now, of course, this is local based, all that, okay, okay. We don't have to get into the specifics and go all over the place. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus it to general audience, general thoughts, is that, you know, because different particular circumstances will vary. That's an issue, that's a separate issue. On a genetic level, I don't recommend for that reason because I think it forces, I've seen people get pissed off that you're recommending something that they don't believe is needed. And we sometimes use that recommend only, only. If I may just make a separate point on that, Deepak, back, back, this is a really important point. We're going back to oral boards in the United States, as you all know. One of the things I use as an analogy for oral boards, right? Or in general, this concept, even with reporting, is I consider myself, now again, don't laugh, okay? Like an analogy, right? I'm like the, you know, like the animal sitting on the side of the road, right? And I'm just kind of watching, okay, this is nothing, this is nothing. As soon as I see something that's exciting, I'm going to jump on it, right? Something dangerous, something this, then that's my job. And by the way, I'm only diagnosing two things every day. Let's make it very easy what we do. We diagnose cancers and acute things. That's it. That's all we do, okay? So that could keep it simple. So that's what I'm trying to catch, right? And that's when I jump on it. And it, this gets at my other point is like, it's like the, what is the boy that cried wolf? The opposite of that. If I'm going by not using recommend too often and things like that, right? When I say those things in my report, clinicians generally know that they need to jump. Um, if you say recommend willy-nilly everywhere and use strong word like that, then as the clinician, I don't know when to react to you and when not to react to you. That is a problem. That is a problem. Okay. I want my clinicians to know that when I say something, you better jump on it or you're in trouble. As far as I'm from an imaging perspective, I'm not the clinician. And there's a lot of other elements here. I'm just reading the report. That's my job. So, so, so when I when I say recommend, people know. Uh, people know. Bishak says something to chase it. They better chase it. They know. They pretty much at this point in my career, people know that. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the, I use a lot of suggest and all those things, and that has a lot of grades where people are like, you know, what you really need to do this and that. That we're gonna have. You know, if we have five people here, they're gonna tell you ten things about that. That's gonna be a gray yeah. zone. You got to live with that. We are not, that's the other thing about trainees. Trainees like everything to be this versus that. That's not how life is. It's going to be a lot of gray zone for sure. Majority of times. The Perfect. Bishak, can I, can I add to this? Uh, because it's a very important question, Deepak. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also situation specific. Uh, where you are practicing, if you're in a small practice and you are one of the readers who's reading consistently versus you're in a big practice where there are, you know, 10, 15 people reading uh, your nuclear scans then um, you know there's a lot of fragmentation. So if you have been practicing for a few years and you're the dominant reader, then the referring physicians get used to your terminology as long as you're consistent. So they get to know when you say uh, compatible with or consistent with what's your level of confidence versus when you say <clears throat> cannot exclude or something like that. Uh, and it, in a smaller practice, it, it is easier to implement. But when you're in a bigger practice where there are, you know, several people reading and you're not reading all the time uh everybody has a different level of and that's the reason we went from uh, for fdg intensity you were you started reporting suvs because what is mildly intense to somebody could be modestly intense to somebody else and could be severely intense to somebody else and then the suv values kind of give you the same thing uh without that mild moderate severe so same thing applies to your impression you say strongly suspicious for compatible with consistent with and so on and so forth. But if you're the sole person reading 90% of the cases, then the, your referring physician base gets to know you over time. And then, okay, when he says this, this when he says this, it means this or he or she or they basically. Uh, but if you're in a, if you're in a, in a big practice, it's difficult to implement. And there you have to be more standardized and, and objective. And as Bishak was saying, you know, uh, attending tumor boards 
multidisciplinary mode. I have learned the most after my residency training. Most of my uh, good education has come from these tumor boards because that's where you see what was reported and what was they what did they do and did you mean them to do that so when you call something you know can't exclude you know to you you were saying okay it's it's a less likely thing but i cannot absolutely exclude to them they had to exclude it so they ended up doing an invasive biopsy or something and that's not what you wanted you just wanted them to follow up on a subsequent scan or something like that and so that's what bishak was very ably trying to tell you be precise and convey your thing and sometimes you have to, you know, you have to recommend to for your protection, but you can leave them, give them wiggle room. So you can say, you know, recommend correlation with tissue sampling as clinically feasible or recommend this as, uh, as if deemed clinically warranted. So that way you are doing your job, but you're also giving them some wiggle room by adding those few things. And that is what comes with, with practice. So if I may add. Thank you. The, Deepak, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Why yeah, yeah. Know? So, yes, Dr. Amol. No, uh, good, good point, Dr. Amol. So, we have a couple of questions. So, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Shubash Keruka's point and question. He's saying, in your experience, what are some common pitfalls or errors in radiology reports that trainees should be particularly mindful of, and how can they avoid these to improve their reporting skills? Um. Well, that's a very uh, loaded question, but I will try to point out two of the commonest things that I've seen that come to the top of my mind, if I may. Number one, too many. So, so when we talk, we always, and even I do this, I have no problem with this. Like when we talk and dictate, right, we will talk like we will say it's natural. It is natural to talk is visualized, is identified, is seen. Nothing wrong in that. Nothing wrong in that. That is fine. But when you're actually sending the report, you're attending or finalizing it, it is important to proofread and get rid of the jargon, okay? Because you have to understand, see, you think it's minor, it is not minor. Because if, just imagine you have a 10, let's say chest x-ray, you have three sentences, right? The is seen in every sentence is already added six words to a 10 character situation. That's a long, that's a large percentage of noise in the signal. You understand what I'm trying to say? So if you get rid of those, all of a sudden your signal improves. The more chances people are reading, the less chances you're making a typographical error, the better medical legally you are and a better chance somebody's going to read the report for one thing, right? And not only the impression, they will probably read your full report because you're so nice, right? This again gets us, by the way, this gets at a concept, if I may slightly digress, more, is that this is gets at a concept, another coin I like to, I coined, culture of teamship. Okay, this is something we need to learn. Culture of teamship. What I do has ramifications for my follow-up reader, for my reader. If I can think of the other party, other situation, we do better job. So that was one, is cut out this is identified is, and the other is the mingling thing I kind of talked about. I think we residents tend to mingle concepts that are just to try to quickly finish it up. They try to mingle concepts in that are two disparate concepts. That's a new thing I've literally started to learn when I'm re reviewing all these reports. It's a new thing I'm beginning to fo get focused on uh, recently. I I've noticed a lot as, as a habit, as a psychological habit that they're sort of confusing uh, two, three things. The biggest thing I will say, if I may just step back, what I notice is residents are very good. Residents are very good, ironically, believe it or not, at very difficult reports. Because what happens is the more complex the report, they get OCD, they kick it in, and they start describing all the important findings in the complex inpatient report, which is actually a good thing because there you want them elaborating, right? The problem I see is, unfortunately, that same habit that they've created where you have to sort of dehabit, if you know what I'm saying, on a report that's just appendicitis with nothing else gets a lot of jargon in it too. So they ironically, please understand me, they ironically struggle with relatively, you're laughing because it's kind of funny, right? That they ironically struggle with simple reports, simpler finding situations, and they do a better job with more complex reports. Now, the problem is we're having more and more inpatient studies as a percentage. So that is actually favoring them, <laughs> but that's not a good thing. But as you go into private practice, some of these other things, when your ER and EDs build up, um, and the problem with that is, the other issue with that is, a bigger issue comes to play. I, I tell them, if you are reading three reports when you're starting, none of this matters. I'm, talking about from, I'm not talking about now the report as such, okay? The energy I'm talking about is the training. I'm talking about that. 
if you're reading three reports, you can fiddle faddle and take all your time in the world. Nobody cares. When you're reading 20, 30 reports, right? If you're spending same amount of energy and simple appendicitis cases, another on the report, forget about the findings, you're going to make mistakes. Because you know what that get, get, tends to get missed? Something major finding gets some got confused because you, there is no way you can spend that much energy equally. You have to know how to sort of tailor your energy differently to different reports. That is the art of medicine. It's called you, you're missing the forest for the trees. Right. Basically. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Dr. Halker. Thanks for a great talk. Therapy is increasing in nuclear medicine. Any suggestions for reporting therapies? Therapies, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything specific to add in a specific realm. I think it's more, like there are certain elements, right? You have to talk about authorized user things. You have to talk about the, there are going to be certain elements, dosing, all that, right? So uh, sometimes you have to talk about in therapies um, that you did consent, stuff like that, right? I don't know if Amol has something to add. I, I don't think, I, I think my talk is kind of on a genetic level. I don't think, I can't think of anything very specific like that. That will depend on that particular thing. Amol, did you have something to add on that? Yeah, so I, your talk was geared more towards uh, radiology imaging in general. And I think uh, if we go for a specific nuclear medicine audience, in nuclear medicine, we are doing a lot more therapies uh, similar to kind of an IR approach where we are doing consults and we are doing the actual therapy and we are doing follow-up and we are dictating all those things actually. And, uh, you know, there, the, you know, there's, there's question of appropriate billing and you have to document how much time you spent and what level of care was provided. And so it's a different consideration to, to imaging. And, and most of us are not trained uh, at that because we've always have the philosophy that we are imagers and not, not physicians. Uh, I mean, I've, Sorry, I, I have to qualify that. At least in the US, the training has been more like that. In India, nuclear medicine physicians are separate and they've always been uh, physicians and had their clinics for, for thyroid for, for a long time. So they, they, they may be a little bit better, but the dictation system in India is completely different too. They, they have a direct transcription where somebody's sitting right next to them and transcribing as they speak and, and so on and so forth. Some of them do have uh, electronic systems as well, so that, that's good. But from a therapy perspective, you have to change your mindset from a radiologist or a nuclear medicine imaging professional to a treating physician. And so the same concepts uh, don't directly apply. Here, you, you, and, and you know, it's very interesting. Uh, you, can, you can check yourself, like if you read a report, for say, for example, in an FDG or a PSMA PET scan, and now you're treating that patient for, for a theranostics purpose, you have to see whether your report helped you in your treatment. It's a very interesting exercise, actually. Like what would have been better in your report when you are actually the treating physician? So putting yourself in a treating physician's shoes is very, very different. And, and that will help your radiology reports as well. But uh, I think there should be a separate talk on, on the therapy uh, reports because they are different. And they are, uh, you know, you have to have a, a consult, you have to have the treatment, you have to have... Uh, the follow up uh, and and we have templates for that but we're tweaking them as well so it, it's i think it, it should be it can be dealt separately but it's an important talk for for the evolving field of nuclear medicine because we are now doing a lot of therapies and we have dedicated uh, thinking of having dedicated therapeutic rotation we already have that for our residents but even for faculty there's going to be like okay today you're covering therapies kind of a thing that's 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 how busy we are getting with therapies there's so no amol uh, yeah oh, sorry go ahead uh, sorry, Harshad here. Uh, Amol, can I just quickly uh, comment, uh, um, you know, add, add to yeah, those sure. excellent sure. points? Yeah. And let me also say, uh, I mean, Dr. Kamath has an excellent talk. Uh, you really have a unique way of, uh, you know, putting forward your, your point and, and uh, an excellent talk. Thank you. But just, just to add to that particular Dr. Hal Halper's um, um, question and, and to add to, to Amol, I think you made uh, excellent points about being a clinician and a, and a reporting uh, uh, kind of nuclear radiologist as well. But, you know, one, one example would be the spec CT, what we do after, the, uh, after each and every therapy. Um, and I think one of the aspects which is very important is to, uh, is to just like a radiologist, but also a clinician at the same uh, at the same point to really uh, qualify and quantify the uptake uh, as well as uh, you know the response to treatment 
so those kind of things uh, should should definitely be uh, be added to it and 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 i'm i'm sure there should be another session on you know how do you report those spec cities thank you yeah i'm sorry this was more targeted at the yeah. radiologist thing as amol said yeah. i do have a point if i make make, make, make an ad uh, not about the therapy or digression point is i'm starting to put in my report some more because uh, i noticed the clinicians are putting in their epic about something about inadvertent errors and typographical stuff which we also have proofread for we have spell checkers but i've noticed epic folks are putting that in there uh, that says something along the lines of we are using um, uh, recognition software and therefore there may be some inadvertent inaccuracies slash typographical errors. I'm starting to put that in my report. I don't know what you think about that at all, but I'm starting to do that because we check as many as we can. You'll be surprised at some of the things I read. You know, there was a there was somebody who created one time all the funny things that come across in our reports, some really serious which yeah. I don't want to really talk about. But like the thing is, you know, those, you, you, so I have started to put a caveat like that because as much as we proofread, things just pass me a mole. I, I, you know, I do a good job, but I, I will tell you, I really do a thorough job, but at the same time, things escape me. You know, we're going so fast now, it's hard to catch up. My classic was uh, for granulomatous disease, my voice transcription always dictated as grandmother's disease. <laughs> and and it, you're right, you know, if you read a lot, then your eyes tire and you miss them. So uh, in my past practice, I used to put the same disclaimer that this report was generated by a voice dictation or slash translation system, and there could be subject to typographical or inadvertent errors. And if there are any issues, please call me and call it. But at Emory, we stopped doing that uh, because uh, we found that uh, legally it's useless. It, it, it's just a false sense of security because by signing the report, you are basically uh, affirming that it's accurate to the best of your knowledge. And so uh, it, it doesn't really, it just cement, it, it helps you uh, feel good that, that, that you've put it. And it also sometimes uh, helps the physicians to be a little more soft towards you. But if, if anything goes to the court of law, it is, it is not going to stand the, the smell test. So it, it's, you, a lot of people do it, but it's not going to help you in a legal situation. See, I, think this is, I love this, Amol. This is a good discussion. This is yeah. good for yeah. us. Yeah, I guess I asked the question, Deepak. Yeah, so Dr. Chopra is asking, there are better apps now with AI like Grammarly, etc., which rephrase your statement better. Our reporting tool gives only spell correction. Any experience with such AI tools? Sorry, you, 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 it came very soft. I couldn't hear it. Can you please speak uh -huh. louder? Yeah, sure. So Jigyasa is asking, there are so many better apps now with AI like Grammarly and all, which rephrase your statement in a better way. So our reporting tool usually power scribes. We only have spell correction. Mm -hmm. Any experience with any AI tools have you had basically which can make our statements or reporting better? I have not, I've heard of Grammarly and stuff like that. I have never used those things for my report. Um, I know they're working on, you know, Mon will know better here. I know they're working on, articles have shown that they're working on figuring out how to phrase things softer, meaning meaning, meaning uh, in understandable terms for, for the average, like, uh, I, I don't know what grade level it is, a reader, patient should be able to read at. So we are cutting down lexicons. The one point I want to make about that, if I may slightly digress, is I do not use, there are two points I want to make about that. One is I don't use, um, what do you call them? The Montagious fractures and all those things, eponyms or something like that. I don't use those things too much because of patients are reading. So if you describe it and you put it in a parenthesis, that's one thing. The second thing I don't do is abbreviations too much unless I have specified it. For example, if I say introductal papillary papillary mucinous neoplasm, uh, IPMN. Now I'm allowed to use IPMN everywhere. The problem I see is we st sort of throw some abbreviations all over the place. Same thing the EPIC people do. And sometimes I don't even understand what these abbreviations stand for. I, I don't know what they're talking about. And then you might be like, what do you mean you don't know? Not to look it up. Now I don't know what you're talking about. Communication failure. Right, so we take these things for granted. So no, I don't know, to answer your question, I don't know of a tool. I don't use Grammarly in my thing. Um, and then these are some of the you know, side points. So there was a there was a uh, there have been articles and and uh, discussions uh, that Chat GPT actually can create reports for you that are pretty good sound. You just input the findings and it actually generates the verbiage and and it's decent. But you have to be very careful 
uh, because it's not seeing it, it the the it's creating the report based on on what you input and 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 you have to proofread it uh, much better because it may uh, as was alluded it may mingle things just to make it sound better and 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 uh, also on and so forth so i would use that very cautiously it's it's a good thing for people who are not good at english and and have moved to the united states and and writing uh, now reports in english and they're not perceived right but uh, i would i would rather uh, develop the good reporting skills yourself rather than uh, and use these uh, uh, tools uh, judiciously because they are uh, they are subject to uh, error and and you know you are finally responsible for the report uh, you sign not not chat gpt so if something happens and it it somehow uh, puts things wrong and you you fail to catch it and and it goes in the report and you get sued then then you you are liable not chat gpt so i would be careful careful about it uh, but there are lots of discussions about how you know you can just give them that uh, there's a left lung nodule which is uh, you know 2.5 centimeters in size and has an uptake scb of 8.6 and and the chat gpt will come up with verbiage for that uh, you know kind of a thing uh, in that and and sometimes it can actually generate the entire report too which is scary. Uh, it's it's good, but uh, you know I would be very uh, uh, skeptical about the accuracy because it's it's only based on what all input you give. And if you're spending that much time to give input to Chat GPT, it's easier for me to actually do the report within that time. But if if I may just add a point, Amol, there is a feature <laughs> and potential feature we may be getting in PowerScribe that we don't have yet that I want to talk about, which is important, which I like, which I like, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. One is that there is a power square feature. I don't know what it's called. I, I think uh, VRAD uses it as well. Is that, you know, where you just kind of dictate the findings and then it auto populates into mm -hmm. the various sections. I am for that. The reason is that is one. And the other thing is in the current one that we use, I have created my templates. I don't know if you know this. Uh, so so when I do when I do templates um, for my all my fields, as an example for body, liver, spleen, this, I don't even have to look at my, uh, power square report when I'm dictating, I don't have to look. I just say field spleen and if it's a ding and it gets to that field. So what I do is I have my standard template, right? I'm looking at my images. I'm focused on my images. I just go, look, 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 look. If I hit an organ that is abnormal, I say field spleen, say what I need to say, I move on. And then I check my report at the end before signing. So it saves me a lot of time. I like these things because what it does, which I think is very important to do a better job in your findings, is it, it 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 splits your ability to get distracted by changing your eyes from the report back and forth. It allows you to focus on the images, make the things, then revert to the report, and it reduces errors. I love these features. These features I am for. Um, the other thing I, I, I say now, don't laugh. These are the minor things I do. We have four screens, right? This is the other thing people don't think about. Your A, B is barcode screens, let's say, and your two, one, you've got two monitors on the side, right? When I put my power scribe on, let's say A, B, C is the barcode and D is my side screen, right? Watch what I do. If I put my, my A screen as the information uh, list, right, the patient, and on, on, on D, I put my power scribe. I put my, my current exam always close to the power scribe report. Why, you may ask? Because if you put it on the opposite side on A, listen to this, this is important you are going to hurt your atlanto occipital joint in the long term because you're going to swing more often, right? If you keep them close to each other, right? You are turning much less over time and, and able to focus in one area. It's the subtle things, but those are important. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dr. T and Dr. Kamen for both your input. Um, actually, uh, basically I've been seeing some of these things um, a lot on the Android phones, like even when you write out the emails, they would basically like alter your statement. I'm not saying that it would just like automatically write all your report. It would still be writing you, but let's say you're writing one statement and then it just like kind of like alters it a little bit that actually conveys your method more like, you know, what you want the, the, the provider to understand what you mean, mean by that sentence. So that is something that I've been seeing online. I I haven't seen it um, so far in our power scribes. And I think that, you know, if that thing comes up and you don't really have to, like, you don't really have to incorporate. If you really like it, then you incorporate it. Otherwise, you can just, like, you know, just skip it and, you know, just move 
fall together with what you want to say. So that's something, if it comes up, would be like a great tool. I think so, but, you know, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And I use a lot of macros. Thank you, Jiga. So thank you very much. I also use macros. I have a lot of macros created for standard things. And I encourage people to use that. And the, the other thing I want to make a point, if I may make one final point, is this is another major problem we have. Okay. And that is people, you know, at institutions, at big institutions, people have, like, I have templates, as you can imagine, right? But other people have other templates, right? So residents get into this thing very in, quickly in their mind that, oh my God, you know, that the template said that, therefore I didn't check that the person had a gallbladder out. They go into these kind of things, okay? I want to emphasize, no matter which template you use, templates by definition, what they mean is a foundation. It's like the blueprint of a house, right? At the end of the day, this is what I'm almost getting at. It's your footprints. No matter what template you use, you have to be active in looking at what you do. I know that sounds simple, but you ask trainees that and they make that fumble all the time. They rely too much and bank on what the template says without even looking at what's going on on the particular case. That is important. So no matter what you do, you can use all sorts of tools. At the end of the day, back to that original point I said, ownership. That's a concept we need to, in my humble opinion, emphasize more in our training in 2024. That is my humble opinion. Yep. I think I think Thank Deepak you so much. Stop here. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's eleven twenty. But uh I think yeah. it's it's a very uh interesting talk and, and very personal to me because I, there are some of my residents here and they know my my pet peeves uh about about report because if you look and and, I, and Dr. Kamath started with that is what is your you're providing a service and what's your product or what's their service? The service is actually the radiology report. So that is the thing that you're offering. That is what you're, that everybody's seeing what you do. And th if that is not polished, if that you don't take ownership of that, then what's the point? You should be proud of your report. So, and Dr. Kamath started with that. So I'm very happy that that our thoughts match and, and I'm happy that, that he's all this thing. So excellent talk. Go ahead, Deepak. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Kamath. This was excellent. Hope we should do this again and again. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Okay. Yeah, he, he's he, Dr. Kamath has offered a, another talk uh, about transitioning to a young faculty. I think that would be a great talk uh, to do sometime in yeah. We'll we'll have we'll see more of Dr. Kamath. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.